Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Duchess Marmet. We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Hey, Stephanie, I don't know about you, even though I've been eating pretty healthy during this stay at home time and I'm working out, I still feel like I'm drinking more alcohol and eating more chocolate than I normally would. And it's left me feeling kind of, I don't know, almost like blah. And the summer's right around the corner. It's basically here. And I'm so ready for our seven day summer liver detox. I am in full agreement, Marnie. You know, I love my daughter and she's a great baker. And now she does it all on her own, except for the cleanup. And we've been doing a lot of, I've been having a lot of baking. And I can tell from everyone else out there, every time I go to the grocery store, that it seems like we're in similar positions because all the flour on the shelves are usually, usually gone. Um, So yeah, we're launching our summer liver detox starting Monday, June 22nd through Sunday, the 28th. And what that entails, you're going to get a kit that'll have a daily nutritional support, that Marnie and I use in our smoothies every single day for the shakes and then just two different supplements that you take. So it's really easy to manage. And then you'll also get a detox friendly recipe book that we put together that has a grocery shopping list. And then there's community support and there's a chat that everybody, you know, communicates in on a regular basis and there are daily emails. So head on over to the artoflivingwell.us slash seven day dash detox to sign up. And you can also message us with any questions that you may have. And we really look forward to you joining us. Yeah, we want everyone to feel great leading into that holiday weekend. Hello and welcome to episode number 30 of the Art of Living Well podcast. Before I introduce today's guest, I just wanted to mention that this episode was recorded during the first couple weeks of the stay at home mandate during the coronavirus pandemic. So you'll notice the Wi-Fi was a little spotty at times. We were all navigating and figuring out technology and we had intended to conduct this interview in person and that of course was not able to happen. So just be patient with us. There's a ton of great content out there and we wanted to make sure that everyone had this information as soon as possible. So hang in there. Um, You may need to turn up your volume in spots or listen closely, but I guarantee that you will not want to miss this inspiring conversation with Michelle Vig. So Michelle is a professional organizer, was an accomplished executive in corporate America for two decades before founding Neat Little Nest. And she did that to follow her personal passion to help unlock people from their clutter and to create the beautifully organized spaces that they've always dreamed about. I met Michelle a little over a year ago at a mutual friend's holiday party and discovered that we only lived a few streets away and that we had both recently, at the time, left our corporate careers to pursue our passions and ignite our entrepreneurial spirit. She was one of those people who you meet by chance and instantly connect. We could have talked all night, and shortly thereafter, we had coffee, and Michelle was so gracious to share all of her learnings and tips that she had uncovered about social media and growing her business. Michelle and her business have been featured in a variety of new media, including Domino Magazine, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, St. Paul Pioneer Press, the Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine, Care 11 TV, where she is a regular contributor. WCCO TV, Fox 9 TV, and My Talk Radio. Michelle is one of a handful of Marie certified decluttering professionals at a gold level or higher, and is a recognized member of the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals. She is one of Minnesota's top 50 women in business, as well as a feature of 40 Under 40 in the Minneapolis Business Journal. 
Michelle has recently written a book called The Holistic Guide to Decluttering that will publish this fall on the notion that there are three forms of clutter, space, time, and mind that are intricately linked. In order to holistically declutter your life, you need to dig into each of these areas, which she will dive into today. Michelle opens up and shares her own personal journey and what led her to embark on her professional organization business. Of course, we talk about the hot topics when it comes to decluttering, like what to do with all your photos, the paper that never seems to go away, and all those objects that carry emotional attachment. Michelle shares her unique and personalized approach to working with clients, whereby she asks thoughtful questions to get to the root of what's causing the clutter or disorganized space. The advice she shares through her own personal experience, as well as working with numerous clients, will inspire you to listen to your heart and slow down. Hit pause when needed in order to find peace in your day-to-day life. This episode is perfectly placed during this current environment as we spend more time at home, and we encourage each of you to find one piece of advice to implement into your life today that will bring you joy. We are so excited for you to be inspired by this conversation. So let's jump in with our interview with Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for being on our podcast today. I know we had to take a little pivot with the current um, stay at home mandate. So we're all working in our home offices and I'm actually in my closet today. It's great to be here. Well, thanks so much for joining. And we want to... um, just get started by sharing with our listeners a little bit about your background and maybe your journey. You know, you had a long career as a marketing executive at Caribou, um, and now, now you've created this thriving business, this organizational business. And so why don't you just share with the audience a little bit? Sure. I, um, I mean, I, I always, probably the first 20 years of my career spent in working in retail marketing environments. And it wasn't something that I had thought I would do my entire life. It was actually my dream as a young teenager to be a singer songwriter. That's really what I thought I would be. Wow. Spent, wow. <laughs> um, I spent my years of high school and my early college actually recording a CD because I really thought that's what I would do. That's but so my cool. parents <laughs> My parents had suggested that maybe a path that included some business that would actually turn into a paycheck would be better. So that's kind of what I ended up doing. I I grew up in, you know, we are a very middle class family and I was the first person to go to college and it was a really important thing for my my parents that I went to college because they didn't go to college. And for me, I, I, I knew I always wanted to go to college and I had to pick a major because I didn't think the singer songwriter thing was, you know, actually going to work. So I picked just something that I loved. And at that time it was advertising and I don't know why. And it was in retail. I, I've always loved retail. I worked at Target when I was very, you know, a teenager and. And I put myself through college with working in retail. So it just seemed natural for me that retail and selling things was what I kind of knew because I grew up doing that. And that's how I did my career. I worked on big retail brands and I was very fortunate to work on some amazing brands as they were in growth experiences. One thing that I would say that's probably the connector of these two different, they seem divergent careers. In my career in marketing and product development and innovation, I was given the tasks often to fix something that was broken or sort of messy. So I was given a lot of great experiences to launch a lot of firsts when I worked at Buffalo Wild Wings, which was growing at the time when I first started working with Buffalo Wild Wings. There were 50 stores. When I left, I had just negotiated their first national deal with ESPN. So it was a really great journey of working on a brand that, you know, just was in this huge growth phase. Same thing for Caribou Coffee. You know, they were almost under bankruptcy and I was able to work with the team and work with the new leader who was uh, Mike Tattersfield, the CEO, 
and just do a lot of different things. So that that's probably that's my best is working on innovative projects that require a lot of breadth of you know knowledge and just trying trying new ideas and failing forward. That's that's amazing. That's a great story. I'd love to hear more about your about your background. Um, so when did you realize that you wanted to launch your own business? And have you always been his like uncluttering and or decluttering um, and organizing been a passion of yours on the side? Yeah. So I wouldn't say my room was organized as a as a teenager. I think <laughs> I was a teenager, but there was this thing about my parents' home. It wasn't. It wasn't a cluttered home. It wasn't decluttered. It was a very lived in home. And there was something about it that sometimes didn't, love you mom, um, <laughs> that didn't make me feel always um, at peace. Mm -hmm. So when I was able to create my own spaces when I moved from my home, I realized then is where it really clicked for me, the importance of space and its impact on self. Mm -hmm. So I, that just is something that I always, I loved DIY everything. I was an HGTV junkie. I, you know, and part of that was, was from my upbringings of not having a lot. And part of it was my passion to just almost like resurrect things that were tired and, you know, needed help. But I've always liked creating new spaces. That's always been something I've loved to do. And then I think the second piece, the specific answer to your question of when did I realize that I wanted to create and start this organizing business was I was blessed to be on this executive team. And we went through a very deep dive on what our passions are and what we love to do. Wow, it was offsite. Awesome. It was several days. It was deep. It was intensive. And we had to write a lot. We had to think a lot. And one of my really dear friends that I worked with for almost a decade, I, I said to him after like the third day, I'm like, Matt, I think I want to be an organizer. <laughs> and to that, he says, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I really do. I really do. I really, when it asked me, what do I love to do? What do I find myself getting lost in? What can I do for hours and I don't even realize I'm doing it? It's cleaning out a closet. It's helping people declutter. It's, and at that point, this was 2014, he said, well, <laughs> then you should start a blog. You know, it's, you're in this big career. You know, mm -hmm. I just became chief marketing officer at a big brand and and he asks, he's like, I don't, you know, let's just, let's just tamper this down just a teeny bit. Let's just have a blog, you know, you can come up with a name and you can do all these fun things. So in 2014, I launched a blog called Meet Little Nest. And my career took off at that point. I, I do the blog. I, I worked 24 seven. I worked a lot. I worked, work was a significant part of my life for 20 years. But the last several years career, corporate career, were really, really intense. And when I was asked to leave Caribou Coffee, and I sat there in the silence, trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, everyone telling me that I should go get a big job at a big brand, because I just, you know, I had left a position of president of the coffee company. And I was very marketable, they told me, to go get a big job. And I went home to my daughter and I told her and my son and my, my husband, I talked about, you know, I got to tell the kids I'm not at care. It's been, you know, 10 years. It's all they've known. And uh, my daughter started crying. And I said, sweetie, it's okay. It's going to be fine. And she asked me, what about the nanny? And then I started to cry. Because I realized that my work had become my life. And I missed out on my kids because she wasn't crying. Because I was, she didn't understand why I, I was crying and hurt that I was not company. She was understanding her world was going to change and she was going to have, the nanny was 
going to have to leave. That's when I thought, okay, I got to look at the back half of my life a little bit differently than the first half. My drive to um, corporate business was really helpful. I learned a ton. I loved time, but toward the end, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I decided with my, the help of my husband, the help of my friends, the support of, I mean, everyone around me who believed in me at that point to just take the leap because what the heck you only get right. one life. And when I looked at mine, everyone else was so proud of what I had accomplished, but I, I doesn't, I wasn't really, it wasn't really something that I was so proud about. So for me, it's exciting because I had no idea what was, and I have a very deep faith. I took a leap and with uh, my eye, I just whoop, went off and it could have just been a thing and it's just a totally different path. So that's what I did. I'm so glad I did. Yeah, so that, that's an amazing story. Um, Thank you for sharing and getting yeah, so personal and vulnerable. That was, it, it'll resonate with a lot of people. Um, I, I agree. And I, um, as I'm thinking about, you know, neat little nest, and I'm so excited to hear more about it. I'm wondering what it means to be Marie, Con Marie certified. Am I saying that right? Yep, you are. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So when I decided to take this leap, I had a lot of advice from a lot of people. And one of the books I read was called um, Working Identity. It's an old book in the 80s, I think. It was written by this Harvard woman, and I can't remember her name. But it said, just go do stuff in the path that you want to go do stuff. And I thought, okay, well, this organizing thing is sure it's sure different than the last 25 years of creating marketing innovation for retail brands and restaurant companies. So I better find out if I actually like this thing I think I like. So if you can believe it, which I can, because I believe in divine intervention at this point, you got to remember I was, I was really sad because I'd worked in corporate for, for a long time and I was sitting at my house and I wasn't sure if I would, you know, if anything, if I'd even make anything of myself after in the second half, in the second act, and I look up, I remember, I see on my dresser, this book called The Magic Art of Tidying Up. I'm mm -hmm. like, I gotta, you know, and I looked, I wrote on, you know, Google Marie Kondo. And if you can believe it, and I do, seven weeks later in Chicago, which is where my in-laws live, she was going to have her second, I think think, or third ever conference to become a certified consultant. And I thought, well, what the heck? You know, it's not that much money. So I'll just go see if I even, are these people like me or not like me? So you had to submit um, pictures from every space in your home. You had to oh be accepted. In. Yeah, you had to <laughs> wow. pay, you had to pay um, money to do the the conference, but you also had to submit. And I was kind of nervous. I was like, Oh my God, what if they don't pick me? And my girlfriend's like, then they don't pick anybody. I mean, seriously, like, look at your cabinets. So it was a few weeks I was accepted a few after that I went to the conference, I got there and I realized these are people like me, it was weird. It was like you, when you just are with your people and the yeah. conversation just exactly how they should be. And no one thinks you're weird. It's because like, you're all kind of weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was it. That was it for me. That was the, that was one of the first solidifying things. So I was certified in Marie Kondo. The, the second thing you had to do, you couldn't get certified just from taking that class. You went to the class, you then had to do practical hours. So again, I went to one of my neighbors and I asked her, I said, I have a really weird request. Can you, would you let me help you declutter your entire home in this order? And she darn near cried because she said, I was just talking to my friend about how I need to get this done in my house. And I was like, okay, there we go. Um, blessing number two. 
So we did that. I got certified. Um, and then I started doing the business stuff, the name and getting it trademarked. And, and then my really early on, because my story was unusual, it was, it was a, it was a new story in Minneapolis. Um, that, job to my new job. It was so weird that people did want to hear about it. So because of that, I was able to get some early work. And I would say for the first year, I was honestly, I was like terrified almost every time I went to someone's house. I was so good in a boardroom. <laughs> I knew how to do, you know, PowerPoints and, but I was really nervous. Um, like in the first year, every time I'd go, I was, you know, I'd prep, I get prepped just like I was going to a board meeting or something. And now it comes it was still natural, but now, now I feel more natural, you know, now I feel more in my skin. So what kinds of services, like, tell us the guts of Neat Little Nest, like what exactly do you do? So we work side by side with homeowners. And I would say for the most, we work with both men and women, but most of my clients are women. Most of my clients have children we work side by side with them to either go through their entire home. I've had clients where we've done the entire um, KonMari method on their entire home. And I've had other clients who really just need help organizing a certain particular area that's really causing them some trouble. And we do that too. So we work side by side, we declutter their homes. And while we, while they're kind of, I, I joke with them when I first meet with them and I say, we're kind of like your, you know, we're like your arms and legs. So you don't have to do the work. I just need you to really think because the first thing that they're doing is decluttering. Cluttering and organizing are totally different things. Sometimes people get tripped up because they actually think they're the same thing, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Decluttering is the act of deciding for your home. Decluttering is the act of deciding what you want to keep. And organ literally is deciding where things are going to live. And you do both, so, correct? And I, we do both. But we do the decluttering first. If you don't declutter first, and this is where I differ from a lot of different organizers. There are organizers you could hire to just come and organize your stuff. I don't do because I really believe that the transformation comes when you actually take stock and you consider what you have and why you have it. And I was going to ask, Michelle, for you to clarify, for those who haven't heard of Marie Kondo, and I know many people have, but not everyone has, and I think what you're saying right now gets to her philosophy. Um, And we'll link all this up in the show notes for people if you want to buy the book, or there's the movies on Netflix now. I didn't have my kids watch a couple of those. Um, But maybe you could just clarify that for people who are not aware of her style or your philosophy? Thank you for asking that. The primary principles of the Marie Kondo method are, um, I would say Marie Kondo, her method is really about the art of the first thing I was talking about. She does speak a little bit about organizing, but really her her philosophy is on the art of decluttering. And that's what I believe so much in. And that art really falls in a few things. One, focus on what you want to keep. Two, declutter by category, not by location. This is huge for me. Any client I've had who just wants to declutter by location, it, it hasn't as worked out as well because it every there's like a tiny, you know, it's like pulling a thread on a sweater. Oh, I just want to do my closet. Well, you really don't. I mean, you you think you do, but decluttering by category is much more effective. I mean, it seems like you. It seems like to me. So I've read her book and I tried some of (laughs) some of her um, tap. You know, I don't know what you call them, but I've tried to do some of it, like the socks and whatever. But you know, it almost seems like you have. Um, like little spots everywhere when you do it like that, as opposed to by room. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're you do it by category or when you do it by room, wait, like if you're doing it by category and you're going, so when you do it by category, you're going to every room in the house basically and removing that category or decluttering that category. Right. Yeah. 
us. Well, and I think that's the the point of one of the main points of the book. If successful in it, it's kind of actually been a marathon. So if you start the first three categories, you're going to have just a mess in your house because mm-hmm. you're not supposed to actually organize into your finished frame, right? So you would then be choosing homes for things in your house. And by choosing um, the art of decluttering, Marie Kondo's main premise is, you know, keep what brings you life. Mm-hmm. I, I have my own personal experience, and this is not, um, this is cut on Marie Kondo in any sense. I, I love her work. But I have found that it's sometimes difficult for people to completely wrap their minds just around that. Mm-hmm. When I work with my clients, I bring in all the emotional intelligence that I had as a leader of people for 20 years in corporate. And one of the things that I have found is that joy is a really awesome filter. And I use that with my clients, but sometimes they get stuck. And so then I pair that with service. So, cause sometimes they're very, you know, if you're, if you're really cerebral, you might, you might, the joy thing is just, a joy thing is from your heart. And if you're really cerebral and you're holding on to something for, you know, and you're really trying to think through it, once I throw in, well, let's talk about its service for a second. Do you use it? Well, no. And so you can kind of, you got to really dig in a little bit to why it is that people may or may not want to keep something. So I use Marie Kondo as a guideline to start the conversation. Even what you were saying, Marnie, about um, the, by category, it absolutely works. But that's why people call me and my team, because sometimes Mm -hmm. they need help getting through it because it's confusing at times. The categories are less confusing, like people get it. It kind of goes with the closet, you know, and they get books because books kind of, you know, they're my over the house. But you, the reason that you look at it together is you, it makes it easier for your mind to pick out what you love. That's why mm-hmm. you, when you see all the things from a category together, it makes it easier for you to pick out what you love and then to discard the stuff that you don't. And Rome, it doesn't really, you don't really get the, the full effect of like, oh, I have 3000 books. Right. That makes That's sense. a great, yeah, that makes so much sense. It's easier to get your head wrapped around that method, I feel like. So how long does it take you when you go into someone's home typically to do this kind of process? Is this like months? Is it a week, a day? Like what is the typical timeline on that? It really depends on the, cl- on the client and their um, life. So and the size of their home and how much stuff they have. So I know it's not a great answer, but for the most part, if I work with clients who have a moderate size home, moderate to large size home with a moderate to amount of things and they have children, it could take five to seven sessions to do the entire house. Hmm. Sounds done amazing. In, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've done it in less, you know, and I ask my clients, do best. One thing I do, like meaning, would it be best? I worked with a, a doctor, um, and she. What we worked a large house, and we had to get through a lot of stuff. Um, was every single Saturday? I think maybe we missed a couple, but over the course of three months. And it was weird because the ones, you know, when we were finished, that one, the next Saturday, I'm, I felt like I should just drive over there. But no, it, it <laughs> depends. And some of my clients, they they really need to get it done. In I had a client who took off spring break, sent her kids to um, the school, like to um, daycare, and we did it in five straight days, every single day. That's that's it. Just depends on their personality. But I would say my recommendation always is if you're going to start a decluttering marathon in your home, set a timeline, whatever feels right to you. But if it's too long, then you're not going to finish. If it's too short, you might be exhausted. So make one that feels about right for you and your family. Some people like to just get her done and other people need a little bit time to process through the, through the stuff. And one category, each, you know, sort of session is about 
what they can handle. Because there's a lot of decisions you have to make. And yeah. the sessions are anywhere between, I won't do anything less than five hours. And there's- At a time? Five hours at a time? Like in one day? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Because, so, because you need to progress. So are people like putting things in bags or like, what does that look like? Like, are you sitting down and you're, or you're kind of running all over the house, grabbing a book from this room, grabbing a book from that room? And you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Um, things really aren't as um, all over the place as you might think, to be honest. You know, they're like, I had a client, the client I was telling you about the, the eight Saturdays. Um, I think she had about 3000 books and they were for the most part in, um, three main areas and we staged. So I keep the client in one spot. My, their job while I'm there is to decide their job okay. is not to run around. Their job is not, their job is to stand there and we bring them stuff. And they decide as they're deciding, we're putting stuff in bags to go to donate or to sell. We're putting things in the garbage. They're just deciding. We're making sure they're hydrated. We take it, you know, we give them breaks um, when they need it. But their their job is to use their brain. And remember, for me, all of these things that I see in their homes, they're just objects to them. They're history and stories, you know, right. so that's why. Um, person I think on that day probably got rid of um 1700 books wow uh, yeah but it was time it was this person was wanting to enter a new phase in their life and wanted to create a new space in their home so do you talk through you know people get emotionally attached to a lot of objects I know or, you know, this person gave me this and how can I ever give it away? I, I don't particularly like it, but, you know, there's meaning attached to it because they gave it to me or it was this person's or whatever it is. Do you talk through that with the client or how do you, how do you get people to feel comfortable getting rid of something that maybe they're keeping out of guilt, for instance? Yeah, that's a great question. First, I do not make people get rid of anyone want to. That's a super important thing. I tell them that straight out the gate. I do not make you get rid of anything you do not want to. That is not my job. That is not my goal. My goal is not for you to get rid of any if you love it all. Um, I have not had a client yet. <laughs> but I did have a client. I'll give this as an example because it really touches on sentimental. I had a client who we went through all of her photos. You know, her daughters were um, just heading off to uh, college with them. So there it was a lifetime of photos for her and her husband and her kids. And she told me right at the beginning, just so you know, Michelle, I will absolutely not get rid of any photos. I just want you to organize them. I said, yeah, that's, we can do that. I said, I'd be surprised if you didn't find one. Nope, my mother... <laughs> She did not have any photos of me from this age to this age. It was a very traumatic thing. She's like, I absolutely will not absolutely get rid. No, no. I'm like, that's totally fine. We do not have to get rid of any photos. But I'm telling you, we're going to look at all of them. And day one, she was, you know, usually what happens is day one, they're a little more on guard with me, you know, and I'll just start, I'll just keep asking questions, just inquisitive questions. So tell me about this. Tell me about this photo. And all of a sudden she's going through and she's starting to throw some away. And she's like, why did I take this picture of this fish? Or why did I, you know? And she's like, it isn't, it's the fear. When you're go, the, there's so much fear in the sentimental stuff. People are afraid to go after it because they're afraid there's some stuff in there that they have to actually come to terms with and work through. Mm -hmm. So it is very common that you will not discard as much as you may in the long run on sentimental items. And I do not push my clients over the point, but I, I know when they don't like something and I will bring it up. I will say, so your niece tells me you don't like that. Can you tell me a little bit about that item? Mm -hmm. And many times it's a gift. Mother-in-law comes up a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I just ask them if they're, you know, it, it isn't until their mind 
clutter, which is real. If their mind is cluttered with stories that they're telling themselves about this object, that someone isn't going to like them or um, it's something they actually have to work through. And so they may work through it with me and they might not, but they probably will work through it over time because as you learn to declutter, you get better at it. And that's why the sentimental category is last. Okay. You are almost like a therapist and an organizer. I'm thinking like just, and you clearly have a gift for asking these powerful open-ended questions to get people to really think. And like you said, declutter, declutter your mind in order to declutter your house. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it kind of, you know, brings me to a question I wanted to ask um, about your upcoming book, which congratulations, first of all, it'll be published. It'll come out in the fall, I believe, right, of 2020. And it's called The Holistic Guide to Decluttering. So can you tell us a little bit about what is holistic decluttering? And I think you've kind of started to touch on it a bit. And how is this approach unique in comparison to other methods of decluttering? There's lots of other organizational businesses out there like you alluded to. Thank you for asking and thank you for your kind words about the book. I'm really excited. The, the premise of the book for me is based on my learnings when I started doing my work with Neat Little Nest. So I started working with clients and I started seeing things that I also saw in my teams at work. And I've read a lot of organizing books. I've a lot of, read a lot of decluttering books. I've read a lot of books on mindfulness. And I've read a ton of books on time management. And I'd realized, oh my gosh, these are all connected. It, it's so clear to me. It, a picture came to my mind that was like, clear as day time clutter mental clutter physical clutter they're all intricately linked absolute belief and if you try to pull just if you just try to do one which a lot of people the one that they're trying to do the you know the most is physical clutter when you try to do that one all on its own and you don't consider that there's mind clutter and clutter that are really interconnected with those you might do a really great job of decluttering your home and then it might, it likely won't stick because if you have a lot of time clutter, it depends on what, you know, what everyone's story is unique. Some people have a lot of time clutter and say no and they take on too much and in, and in doing so, they're not successful and they have physical around them, and they have a cluttered mind, and they feel anxious. Some people have too much physical stuff, and they can't make the decisions on it because their mind is so cluttered with who might think, what might think. They're not listening to their own heart and listening to their own path. So that's what the book is about. The book actually walks, helps people declutter the three areas. It provides them with practical tools and inspiration for each area of the holistic guide to decluttering because a lot of books really organizing books one and i i don't believe it's it's enough it's fine if you just want to organize your house but if you're looking for that big transformational change you're going to have to do a little bit more than just you know clean up the bedroom well it gets yeah. to it the holistic approach is similar to kind of what Marnie and I preach a little bit or, you know, our philosophy when it comes to health and wellness, and you have to do the hard work and you have to get to the root and peel back those layers, whether it's decluttering your space or making, you know, forming new habits and improving your health. It all gets back to the, the same, I think, fundamental belief. And I, I'm wondering if, um, you know, when you go through this process with a person and you get them to kind of declutter mentally declutter the physical that you know you you work on all those things with them do you talk with a client about purchases moving forward so um, things that kind of add to clutter in the future if that makes sense i'm just curious that's a great question and i would say i don't need to it becomes super obvious mm -hmm. so when you work with if you work with me on your entire home 
not like we just did a little tiny, you know, space, but if you worked with me decluttering your entire home, we are having these conversations, right? We're together for six to eight hours for five to seven sessions, and we are talking through it. They're coming up. The, the, the gift for me is when I finally see their face, you know, on day three, it's like, ah, I got it. It's, I'm part of this. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, at the beginning, it's a lot of pointing fingers and my husband and my kids and my kids and my husband. And, <laughs> um, but as you work through it, you realize that they're going through an internal change, an uh-huh. internal transition. And when you have a home for everything, when you, because, you know, the first part's decluttering and then we create while they're decluttering, we are organizing, we are creating systems. And this is where Marie Kondo and I part ways a little bit too, because um, I really, really believe in the importance of how space makes you feel. So Neat Little Nest has a very particular look. We, We care about the tiniest of details in the design of the organization because I want you to open the, I want you, you've gone through all the work of decluttering your whole home. I want you to open that cabinet and be like, man, now this makes me happy. And when you know where everything goes and it's labeled in a darling way and everything looks really nice, there's a very, there's a much higher chance that you're going to keep it looking that way because you're proud of yourself because of the work that you've done. So when I say to them, you know, so this is your area for backstock in your pantry. You know, it's not this plus this plus this plus this. This is what we're dedicating. If at that time we would ask, I would ask, are you a Costco shopper? Are you not? Do you have a place to store this stuff? And based on those answers, we create systems for their family. Mm-hmm. And then um, those systems are what they manage. They manage that system. And until their life really significantly changes with an adding of a child or a child that leaves the home for college, those systems can put, stay pretty steady for quite some time. It almost seems like a gift that you're, you know, if you're working with someone that has children, with a gift that you're giving to your whole family because the kids are then growing up with these systems and understanding the process and, you know, why you want to have a decluttered life and a decluttered mind. And I love that. Like I can see the power behind that and the benefit for everybody in the house. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And mom is tired. Um, I know, <laughs> yes. I know a lot of mom, moms are tired. And one of the things that I, I preach to my mom clients, I, I share this on Instagram. I say it all the time. And I think, we as a we as a mom collective have done our children a little bit of a disservice by servicing them too much. Mm-hmm. And so I, what I work on with the moms that if I see it, and I'm telling you I see it a lot, I will remind them these children are your children to grow to adults. It is important that they learn this skill. So two things that I ask my clients to do. One Please be the leader. When we, when, I, when we put these organizational systems in place, you do not have to keep them up alone. Be the leader of your family and hold your children accountable to help. Yes, it is more difficult path. Yes, it's going to require more conversation. Yes, your kids are not going to be happy about it. It doesn't matter because you are the leader of your family and your husband needs to participate and so do your children. And I will tell you when I worked with love, I worked with a lot of clients and a lot of families and the children decluttering is contagious. The children do get on board. And yes, mom is like the one who is going to be the one rallying the team um, to get the stuff done that needs to be done. And I, it's also why I preach a lot of routines so that people can feel confident that they have some routines in place to be successful keeping their homes to a place where mom doesn't lose her, her mind and um, feel like she just has to do it all because mom's too tired to do it. 
I, Michelle, I cannot agree with you more. I agree with every single point. And what one thing I love that you share on Instagram all the time. So for everyone out there who doesn't follow Neat Little Nest, get out your phone um, unless you're driving and follow her because she shares so much valuable insight and tips. You can learn so much from just following you. Um, and your Sunday reset that I've been watching now for at least a year. And maybe you can share a little bit about what that entails with your family. And I've been talking about it. And after we met recently, Michelle, for coffee, I was talked to my husband. I said, let's get it on board. I had it on the calendar every Sunday. It didn't happen for a month. And now we're in this stay at home mandate. And I said, okay, this week, this was last weekend, we are going to do the reset. And my kids were all on board. No one complained. And we got so much done because now we don't have anyone coming to the house to clean or anything like that. So it's our responsibility. Kids are learning about cleaning toilets and their bathrooms um, and tidying up, but they're doing it all on their own. They were, and again, it was seamless. We had some music on. It was fun. My husband was on board. I mean, it was actually quite enjoyable. And I was thrilled because for the first time ever, it was Sunday by four o'clock, the house was clean. Or maybe we did it after dinner. I can't even remember now. And I got to sit on the couch for the first time, and I'm not kidding you, like five or six years, and watch a show with my husband at night. And I wasn't running around vacuuming, trying to clean the floor and put the dishes away. And it was, and it, you know, it was free. It didn't cost money. It was an hour of everyone's time and we were done. So maybe talk a little bit about um, what that entails and really what are your tips are for getting families on board and empowering the moms to, like you said, you know, they're tired. So they need, um, they need to be leaders and, you know, role model these behaviors for their kids too. First of all, I'm so happy to hear this. I can't even, like, I'm just so happy. Um, <laughs> the weekly reset is probably my number one favorite routine for sure. And I call it weekly reset because for my family, it is on Sunday, but for other families, um, they can choose a different day of the week. I like Sunday because it sets me up for the rest of the week. And just to give a quick, quick synopsis for the listeners on what it is, is every week on Sunday, we as a family do a few main things. One is planning for the week ahead. So I do my calendar. My husband and I sit down and we look at our weekly plan. What are the kids doing? What are we doing? What meetings do we have? What after school activities? And do we have everything covered? That's our first step. It's like, what are we doing for the week? It's changed a lot since we're in lockdown. Yeah. But, but before that and soon to come, It'll be back to, you know, our regular lives, very busy lives. And it's a really nice way to look at the week. And during that time, we also plan the meals for the week based on what our activities are like. So lots of driving around after school to practices, probably going to do something a little bit easier to make. No activities, we might step up our game in terms of cooking. So we do planning first. Then the second thing that we do and even in that planning phase, our children are involved. We have this, we want our children to be involved so that they, it's a learning tool for them. Um, when you look out for a week, it helps your mind sort of settle down to know what's happening for the week ahead. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing we do is we literally, this is my favorite part as mom, is we put everything back to its home. So our house is not perfect 24 seven. We are family, we are normal. The reason I love the weekly reset is on Sunday for a little bit of time, everything is back to its home. All the beds are washed and made um, and everything's back and it's peaceful. And Sunday night for our family is very peaceful. Everything's back in its place. We know what we're going to do for the week. Um, the other things we do on the weekly reset is meal prep. So we know what meal planning we have when our kids are going to school. They would pre um, prep their snacks for the week for their lunches. They would prep, still do while we're here, prep their breakfast, you know, their um, decant, their breakfast cereal. We would get all that stuff done together as a family. And because we have done it for so long, you know, it doesn't really take us that long. It takes us maybe even on the biggest weeks, maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Because the mm -hmm. other things that we, um, I say clean as you see fit, you know, I don't have, a, I don't follow a really strict cleaning schedule. If people want to, they should follow Clean Mama. She's amazing. I love her. 
but I just clean as we see fit. But because we have so many other routines in our house, our, our cleaning isn't a, a big issue because we're kind of doing other routines that help that stay stick together. Yeah, and I think you've awesome. a good point. With everyone being home now, routines look differently, but the planning and the meal prep is going to become really important, hopefully soon, when we come out of this mandate. But I think it's also a good time now to take advantage of the t- time we have at home. Um, so I don't know if you have any practical tips, especially given right now, depending on when this airs, where we'll be with all of it. Um, well, it's funny you mention that, Stephanie, because, okay, so I, you know, everyone's life is a little bit turned different right now with the, with the coronavirus and being inside the home more. This literally, this past Sunday, we didn't do the reset. I, I don't even know why. I think we, it's because, you know, in this weird phase. Yesterday, which was Monday, I felt funky all morning long. I couldn't figure it out. And finally, I'm like, it's, you know, it's because you didn't do that. You didn't do the planning, the reset. And I ended up calling the kids at lunch because, you know, we're home. You know, they're, they're school from home and my husband's working from home and I'm working from home. <laughs> and I'm like, guys, we didn't do the reset and I, we just need to. It took us 20 minutes, picked up the whole house. We planned the week, we put the calendar up. And I just instantly was like, okay, I know what I need to do now. So, so even, um, I say it's even more important inside of the lockdown or as important as it was for me outside of the lockdown, because inside the lockdown, it's a little bit easier to get like, oh, I have all the time in the world. I, you know, what do I have to, I can't go anywhere. But I think if you have big aspirations for your life and big goals for your life, these types of small routines can really help keep you so that, you know, what was happening to me yesterday morning was my mind clutter was just not, it was cluttered. My mind was cluttered. I didn't know what I should be working on or doing or focused. Mm-hmm. Even though I kind of knew I just wasn't doing it. So, and obviously now during this time, you can't go into people's homes. Are you helping people virtually or mostly just like, what? I've chosen not to. Okay. I've so, chosen to just take this time as it, um, as it is. And I'm writing a lot more on the blog. I'm finishing, um, working on the book, the finalization of the book. And, you know, I, I think it's an important time. This is my opinion. There's a reason for, for some reason we're all at home. So I've chosen to just be at home. I love that. Cause you could keep yourself very busy, just as busy as you were right. Even in your, your corporate days, like you talked about with doing at home virtual sessions, but yeah. And I, and I think everybody needs to find what they need to be doing during this time. It, it's like a step back from your busy life, from everyone's busy lives. And <clears throat> hopefully people are listening to themselves and finding what resonates with them and discovering how to, you know, use your time during this time at home, if that makes sense. That makes so much sense. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think because a lot of people have asked me, you know, are you doing a big declutter thon or and I honestly, my heart just hasn't said that that's what people need right now. There are some people who are gonna like to your point, they're they're gonna want to declutter every single space in their home. But you know what? If you don't feel like it, because you, um, there, you know, you're working through something else, or this time is becoming a bur- really large, significant financial burden or emotional burden, then you know it's time to listen to your heart and for what what it needs, because it's going to share what it needs. And I, I really agree with you that it's the time. And for me, the first part of this year was really, really busy within homework. Probably the busiest I've ever been. And so getting a pause, um, you know, that, that's what I felt like was for me the necessary next step. But for others, it might be something different. So I've actually kind of embraced the whole decluttering mode these last few weeks just because I've had more time. Um, I, I can't say I've done it in a very organized manner, <laughs> but, I'm, but I am doing it and it feels amazing now, one thing that kind of drives me crazy is I don't have anywhere I can bring the stuff right now. So it's kind of 
starting to line up in my garage, but just the act of cleaning something out and getting it out of the house, I, I feel lighter. It's amazing how I actually physically feel lighter um, from that process. But a question I have for you is one thing that I struggle with, my husband and I both, is that we have papers probably from like 2000, every kind of, you know, financial papers and bank statements and I, so many documents. I mean, we have boxes of documents. What do you suggest to people do with all these papers? Any, any good tips? Well, A, this papers is probably my favorite category to help people with. It, it really is. And I, I get a lot of weird looks, but paper is honestly one of the largest burdens that people feel. That when, yeah. they, when I ask they this the paper thing, especially if we're my age, which is you know middle middle age, than any other age, um, because we've lived in a paper world and a digital world. We've 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 learned and done both. And my philosophy when I help people with papers, one, it's a little shocking. It's from the condo book. If you didn't remember it, I'll re I'll remind you. It's to go in with a mindset that you need none of it. It could just all be gone, burned down. So you don't actually do that. But if you go in with the belief that you need to find it all online, you need zero of it, then you will actually pull out what you really do need. So it's one thing that I think I will be working on. I don't know if it's 2020 back half or 2021, but I have a system that I work with my clients on. We go through all their papers and filing. Um, I call it like a home filing. Credentials. And usually it's the size of one small. I them through, you know, I've helped people. One of my, 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 my one client, we did papers, I think for 19 hours, not straight, but, um, and we got hers down to, you know, one file cabinet because you just don't actually need as much as you think. You need a lot of it shred and a lot of it just making the leap to online. But the, the real um, answer your question, how do you, the backlog, you just have to go through. You have to slug it out. You and your husband go through it and, and do it. Um, it's the creating of the file of where you're going to, what are you going to actually keep and file in the long run? And what are you not? So I often create a system for people that's two part and it's neat. It's a two part system that is, um, simple two little magazine files one says needs attention and one says to file and the to file magazine file really it's discerning what gets in there like it should be stuff that really needs to be filed like stuff that's going into your taxes your insurance um the actual policy, not the fact that you've paid it for you know january and i really encourage people to go through their mail every single day that oh. is probably the place that makes people the most anxious is if mail every day and i most of my clients when we start they don't they go through it maybe once a week maybe once two weeks it becomes this big thing and then they have this fear and then it freaks them out and then it's just all this continual process but 90 percent of your mail is just junk and then if you get it down to what do I actually need to do and what really needs to be filed, then when you need to file it, you can file that some other time. But that needs attention. I tell them to look at every week. Oh, I love this. I so needed it because I started doing this the other night with like medical files that were going back years and years. And my, one of my goals over this, the coming weeks is to go through the papers in my file cabinet. And my husband is the worst if you're listening or when you listen. Um, so I love these tips. Thank you for sharing. Michelle. So is mine, by the way, the worst, like I can't, <laughs> the amount of papers we have in this house is horrendous. <laughs> well, ladies, you're not alone. It's, it's the amount, the amount of papers Americans have in their homes is a lot. And 
I think the reason the category is so difficult is that every single sheet of paper is a decision. Do I need it? Do I not need it? Should I, should I think about, and I think as you start to go through your mail every day and you, and you start to get rid of stuff and see, you know, like rules, I will often, people will just be like, well, I need that manual. I'm like, okay, when is it? So tell me what you actually do though. What do you mean? <laughs> I mean, if your fridge broke, what would you do? And then I say that most of the time they say, well, I would just repair people. Okay. Would you ever have ever gone? To no. Then they can go, right? Oh, I never thought of it that way. They say, well, well, well what if I need to look at the manual? Okay, well, let's try it. And they say, okay, we look at the refrigerator manual. I said, tell me what it is. And I get my phone out and I say, what's the model? And they say, I said, don't look at the paper. Go look at the fridge. We type it in. I said, well, here it is right here online. Oh, I didn't really think I could just go online to get it. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, you can. So they, and they know which ones are important. Once you start putting that, those questions in place, it's like, oh, you know mm -hmm. right. Actually, these three manuals I've looked at time and time and time again. I'm going to keep these three and they usually get rid of like a you know, hundred other ones. So I think it really is a matter of talking to yourself about what you really do. And that's why I brought up our age because if you've kept papers because you were taught to keep papers and you haven't gone to a place yet where you feel confident that you can get those papers online, you just, you know, you're kind of in that middle murky land. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Like truly. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so as we kind of wrap up this interview, which has been amazing and very um, helpful and inspirational all at the same time. And I know you've peppered in so many different tips um, for people, but if you could leave our listeners with just one or two to help them on their journey wherever they are with decluttering and organizing, what would that be? I would say if you are feeling overwhelmed by physical clutter in your spaces, my number one advice would be commit to the marathon. Do it once. If they need a checklist, I have a free checklist on my website that goes category by category, but commit to decluttering. Your, your home. That is my number one piece of advice. Just finish the marathon. Um, my second piece of advice is embrace, once you've done that, is embrace a routine that will help you keep it that way. And that is why I'm such a believer and a preacher of the weekly reset. It, it gives you a place to know that you're going to be able to get it all back. And that's easier week at a time than, you know, when, when a person in the household just has had enough and, you know, loses it. Those are my, mm -hmm. those are great tips. Those are awesome tips. Um, and where can people find you? You mentioned your website. I know you're on Instagram. Can you let us know that? I'm on all, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, but I would say Instagram is the place I'm the most, I spend the most time there and my website, absolutely. www.neatlittlemom. Okay, great. I know you mentioned the checklist. So if I go to your website, you guys just drop in your email and you'll get the decluttering checklist that you can print out. And finally, as we wrap up, there's one question we like to ask all of our guests, and that is, what does the art of living well mean to you? To me, the art of living well is living a life that is true to your soul's call. I love that. That's Perfect. so deep. <laughs> yes. Deep and um, relatable on so many levels yes but yet simple too but it's hard right. to do the work and clearly you've done the work and look at you know all your success from that because i feel like when you 
when you're really doing something you're passionate about and you believe in, and like you said, you're doing what your soul is calling you to do, you're going to be successful because how can you not be, right? Well, and I, I, I appreciate that, but I, I will say the difference in success when you're living a life that's true to the call of your soul is it's not outward success. Right. It is inner. And that is the difference for me is that my heart is at peace and I'm practicing it every day. You know, I have not come to some form of having finished it. I think that's part of it as well is to declutter holistically. It is a lifelong journey, just like you guys talk about with health. So if you, and it, it's if you make it a priority, if having a space and a mind and a calendar that are, that, that feel like what you can handle and everyone can handle a different amount, then you're living with intention, but it's a practice every day, right? We all get off the, you know, the wheels come off the bus. Everyone's wheels come off the bus. It's a matter of kind of bringing yourself back. I love that. So true. And you said this week when you didn't do the reset, you noticed, you know, on Monday and then you did it. And I can't be like, when you said you didn't do it, I was like, well, the first time I did it was this week, but it's nice to know that you have those moments too, right? We're not, no one's perfect. No, no. I I mean, my, I, this funny little story, you might cut it from the podcast, but my, my daughter, as we've been in um, the lockdown, we, she came up with this thing called the rage so every day someone wins it <laughs> and at first it was kind of funny and I've won it <laughs> once um but now every day because she brought this little ward up we if we're kind of going off the you know off the deep end it's like well you want to win the rage award today and <laughs> I love that yes. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> maybe not actually I'm just gonna bring it down a little bit I, need I think to that's so, that. so do I. It's yes. so relatable. I think yes. you should post that online. I think a lot of people would relate to that. Oh my gosh. I the Instagram stories, I think last week, cause I'd won it. You know, that was, my daughter was like, and I actually haven't, I'm the, I've won it the least, but my daughter reminds me, but yours was the worst. Like you only, <laughs> you only won it once, but you are just like off the reservation. Oh. I, I had a meltdown a couple of days ago. I'm usually the calmest one in the house. And I had a meltdown where I actually just like screamed at the top of my lungs and everybody went silent and they're all looking at me like, oh my God, what is wrong with her? And then I like stepped out of the room and I came back in the room and I'm like, okay, I'm okay. I just, I just needed to do that for a minute. Yep. We've all been there in the last couple of weeks. I had to give myself timeouts. So Oh, anyway, well, thank th- you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I loved everything you said. Uh, love to have you come to my house sometime, actually. <laughs> I know, I was thinking the same. And she only lives a couple blocks from me, too. So, <laughs> yeah, we can social distance right. walk. Absolutely. All right. So, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, Stephanie, can you believe that the average mass-produced bottle of wine can contain up to 16 grams of added sugar? I know, that's crazy. That's more than a glazed donut. Oof, she kind of grosses me out. (laughs) But anyway, we're so excited because we finally found clean crafted wine that we enjoy, that tastes good, and we don't feel like crap the next day. I am loving these Scout and Cellar wines. We've tried several of the different types and all of them taste good like Marnie said and we love the fact that there's no added sugar they're free of chemicals and pesticides they're grown with organic grapes and sustainable farming practices and they have very low sulfites which are one of the things that can often cause the headaches the next day and you know it's summertime it's patio season it's so nice to just get outside if you enjoy having a glass of wine um, We are super excited to be part of Scout and Cellar, and we do have our online shop. 
So you just head on over to www.scoutandseller, that's S-C-O-U-T-A-N-D-C-E-L-L-A-R.com slash the art of living well. You can have clean crafted wine delivered to your door. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.